Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the IHER Health Equity Seminar Series. Uh, my name is Utsa Khatri. I am faculty um, within the Department of Emergency Medicine, as well as at IHER. Um, and I'm so excited that you're all joining us uh, for this exciting lecture today. Um, it is my great honor and privilege to introduce our speaker, Dr. Donald Warren. Dr. Donald Warren joined the Johns Hopkins Center for Indigenous, Indigenous Health as co-director on September 1st, 2022. He is an acclaimed physician and one of the world's preeminent, preeminent scholars in Indigenous health, health education, policy, and equity, as well as a member of the Oglala Lakota tribe from Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Dr. Warren will also serve as Johns Hopkins University's new provost fellow for Indigenous health policy. Warren comes from a long line of traditional healers and medicine men and is a celebrated researcher of chronic health inequities. He is also an educational leader who created the first indigenous health focused masters of public health and PhD programs in the US or Canada at North Dakota State University and the University of North Dakota respectively. Warren previously served at the University of North Dakota as professor of family and community medicine an Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, as well as Director of the Indians into Medicine and Public Health Programs at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Dr. Warren's career is informed by rich work and life experiences. He served the Pima Indian population in Arizona as a primary care physician and later worked as a staff clinician at the NIH. He has also served as a health policy research director at the Intertribal Council of Arizona, executive director of the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board, and a faculty member at the Indian Legal Program of the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. Dr. Warren has received many awards recognizing his research accomplishments, educational leadership, and service work, including the American Public Health Association's Helen Rodriguez Trias Award for Social Justice and the Explorers Club 50 People Changing the World. Dr. Warren received a Bachelor of Science degree from Arizona State University, Doctor of Medicine degree from Stanford University School of Medicine, and a Master of Public Health degree from the Harvard School of Public Health. We are really excited to welcome Dr. Warren today. Um, please uh, keep in mind that we do have a option to submit your questions and we'll hopefully get to as many as we can um, at the end of his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Warren. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Katri. Really appreciate the kind introduction and good to see uh, so many people here as well as uh, people online as well. So uh, very happy and honored to be a part of these uh, important discussions. And I really appreciate the work that's coming out of the relatively new uh, Institute for Health Equity Research right here at, at uh, Mount Sinai. There's, it's exciting to see the work that's moving forward. And I really appreciate the opportunity to make sure that indigenous voices are at the table and part of the discussions as we move forward toward promoting health equity. So today we'll look at the impact of unresolved trauma on American Indian health equity. And I'll try to leave enough time at the end in case there's any questions, we could have some potentially through uh, the chat on Zoom, uh, but also certainly here in the room if there's any, any questions. So what we'll talk about is uh, initially terminology. We hear the terms American Indian and Native American used interchangeably, but they actually do have different legal definitions. We'll go over that. We'll look at a brief history of policy, uh, colonization, and marginalization, and how that has had an impact on health inequities for Indigenous peoples. And we'll look at some contemporary challenges, as well as potential solutions and identifying a path forward. So I'd like to start these discussions with uh, terminology. And the racial designation is American Indian and Alaska Native. So if we think of the United States, of course, we have the lower 48 states plus Alaska and Hawaii. And when we think about North America, so it's 49 states uh, for the U.S. and North America, the racial designation is American Indian and Alaska Native. And at the federal level, it's actually the Office of Management and Budget that determines the races and ethnicities. Why it's OMB, I have no idea. I, I've never been able to understand exactly why it's Office of Management and Budget that determines that. But there's several races and one ethnicity that's formally acknowledged by the federal government. The ethnicity is Hispanic, so you're either Hispanic or non-Hispanic. And then there's other racial designations. Uh, 
So that's why you'll hear the term non-Hispanic white, for example. So there's white, there's black or African-American, Asian, uh, American and Pacific Islander, and then for the indigenous North American populations, American Indian and Alaskan Native. And the reason it's Alaskan Native is that not all indigenous people to Alaska are American Indian culturally or linguistically. So a large group of uh, indigenous Alaskans, the Athabascan tribal groups, are American Indian from a linguistic and cultural perspective. There are Athabascans uh, even in the Southwest. So Navajo and Apache tribes are actually Athabascan linguistic groups. So Athabascans are all across North America. But if you go north from there and look at the Inupiaq or Inuit populations, they are not indigenous just to North America. They're also in Siberia, across North America, and also Greenland. So they are not American Indian, but they are Alaska Native. So if you call them American Indian, they actually get offended because that's not their cultural group. So that's why it's American Indian and Alaska Native. Um, and thinking about this even further... One thing that's unique about experience of tribal members in the US is that we do have tribal sovereignty and being an, an enrolled tribal member is actually a political designation. So much like we can be the a citizen of the United States or the resident of a state, we can also be citizens of our tribal nation. So for many of us, we have tri citizenship, citizens of the US, citizens of our tribe and residents of our states. So as a result, we're eligible for things like Medicare as US citizens, Medicaid as state residents, but also Indian Health Service as tribal members. So we have a unique status as enrolled tribal members from a political perspective. One thing to keep in mind is that the Indian Health Service user population uh, does not encompass all American Indians and Alaska Natives. So there's about 2 million people who use IHS and in the last census, there were 9.7 million self-identified American Indians and Alaska Natives. So it's a little over 20% of American Indians and Alaska Natives use IHS. But we'll often see IHS data used as representing all American Indians. And it doesn't. So, for example, I'm not in the IHS database. You have to have an active chart within the last three years to be included in the database. And I lived in places where there were no IHS facilities and I have private insurance. So why would I go to IHS? I can actually go to the private sector. So we have to be careful and cognizant of the fact that IHS data does not represent all American Indians and Alaska Natives. It's probably the best database we have, but it's not all inclusive. It's actually a minority of American Indians and Alaska Natives. So we've also heard the term Native American, right? And we hear that used interchangeably with American Indian. But if you are in Hawaii, are you an American? You bet, right? So in 1978, there was actually the Native American Programs Act that defined Native Americans as American Indians and Alaska Natives, but also Native Hawaiians and indigenous people to other U.S. territories. So American Samoans legally are Native Americans. The Chamorro indigenous people of Guam are Native Americans. So I try to be cognizant of that fact. And if we're using the terminology, we should use it correctly. So it's fascinating just even looking at the origin of those terms. So why is it that I'm an Indian? Anybody have any ideas why I'm called Indian or why there's an Indian health service? Anybody know? People usually don't know, but actually it's because of Columbus. He thought he was in India, believe it or not. So that's why we have the West Indies. That's why we have American Indians. It's because Columbus was lost at sea, therefore I'm an Indian. Isn't that remarkable? So we have an Indian health service, a Bureau of Indian Affairs, because Columbus genuinely thought he was in India. Um, but why are we Americans? Where does the word American come from? Does anybody know? Any thoughts? On? Yes. Uh, cartographer from Italy. Yeah, do you remember his name or no? Mm -hmm. um, Amer uh, Amerigo Vespucci. Yeah, Amerigo Vespucci. Very good. So uh, Amerigo Ves uh, Vespucci basically named North America and South America after himself. Isn't that remarkable? <laughs> so, so we have to be cognizant of the terminology of the history. So every time we say American Indian, we're actually paying homage to two Italians, right? Amerigo Vespucci and Columbus, you know, every time we say American Indian. So a lot of us don't like that terminology just because the history is not really accurate. So many of us use the term indigenous and indigenous peoples are the original inhabitants of various parts of the earth. And it just happens to be the indigenous people of the 49 states of the US in North America are the American Indian and Alaska Native population. So it's really remarkable on the census, I have to check a box that says American Indian and Alaska Native, even though I'm not Alaska Native, I'm American Indian. So I, I try to be cognizant of the terminology that we are using. So when we think about the history of colonization 
And some of the commonalities across indigenous populations, particularly those who are colonized by Great Britain, we see a common outcome. And they had a common playbook, for lack of a better term. And that included, of course, taking of land and enslaving local indigenous peoples, but also putting uh, indigenous peoples into boarding schools or residential schools. We saw that same pattern in the US, in Canada, as well as Australia and New Zealand. And it's really remarkable when we look at the history of colonization, we see common health outcomes. So we have the same health disparity patterns for indigenous peoples all over the world as a result of colonization. And when you think about it, we have loss of land, loss of territory, loss of economies, loss of language, loss of culture, loss of traditional food systems. So of course, there's going to be a health impact uh, based on all of that loss. And here in the Northeast, just think about some of the terminology that we use to describe where we are. For example, New York, right? So paying homage to Great Britain and colonizers, every time we say New York, or the whole idea of New England, how offensive from an indigenous perspective, right? New England, New Jersey, New York. And we use these terms all the time without even thinking about them. From an indigenous perspective, that's paying homage and uh, actually paying respect to the colonizers. So that's something to think about. You know, what is the original terminology? We should know these things based on where we live. So we can see there's a huge impact of colonization on land and resources, and certainly on access to things like traditional food systems. And not surprisingly, we see terrible uh, uh, health disparities. So there's been a lot of recent uh, research done in recent years looking at the impact of emotional and psychological trauma. And we know that when there's traumatic events in a person's life that can have a long-term impact on their health, it could be one-time events, uh, accidents or injuries, a diagnosis with a chronic disease, these type of traumatic events can have emotional and psychological impact. We can also see toxic stress or ongoing relentless stress having a huge impact on the health of our, our populations. So when we're under toxic stress, we see stress hormones, so elevations and things like cortisol and epinephrine and all of the uh, physiological impact of those elevated stress hormones. And things that cause toxic stress can be things like living in poverty, living in marginalized communities, living within racism. And unfortunately, we still see racism in the United States, and that does have an impact on population health. There's also been a lot of work in recent years looking at childhood trauma, and particularly adverse childhood experiences. And we know that the more adversity someone faces during childhood, the worse their health status is as an adult. And one of the areas that we're moving forward in terms of our research through Johns Hopkins and other uh, indigenous focused areas of academics is the impact of historical trauma and colonization as a stressor and an, uh, an area of unresolved trauma that's having an impact on health even today. So we'll talk a, a little bit about that, but in very basic terms, if you lose culture, language is taken away, food systems are taken away, and you become dependent on uh, unhealthy lifestyles and uh, dependent on programs that are providing unhealthy food, for example, of course, that's going to have a health impact. So when we think about ourselves uh, in a holistic manner, this is a, a medicine wheel, and it shows four components of who we are as human beings, spiritual, mental, physical, and emotional. And we can have trauma in any of those are arenas, right? We can have physical trauma, have level one trauma centers for physical injuries. And as Ed mentioned, there's been a lot of work looking at psychological and emotional trauma. And I would say for American Indians and other indigenous peoples, there's also spiritual trauma, that deep rooted spiritual connectedness to place, loss of access to sacred sites, and even having our traditional religions made illegal. So for those who might be interested in looking it up, uh, you can Google uh, the Code of Indian Offenses. And yes, Google is a verb, right? So we can Google things now. But uh, the Code of Indian Offenses in 1883 made our religion and our ceremonial practices illegal, punishable by withholding food or imprisonment. Isn't that remarkable? So it was the law of the United States to say specifically things like the Sundance were against the law. The work of what they said was so-called medicine man is illegal. So we had our, our religious practices made illegal. So many tribes unfortunately lost that historical connectivity to traditional ceremony and religious practice. And that was in place for almost 100 years. It took until 1978 
when we had the American Indian Religious Freedom Act to reverse the code of Indian offenses, but we had 95 years in which our ceremonial practices were against the law. Out of a show of hands, how many people knew that? You know, there's very, so a few people did, that's outstanding, but most people don't know that part of our history, but it's an important part of our history. We have to acknowledge that there were policy-based decisions and laws that led to disparities and inequities. So let's just look at the lower 48 states and what we now call uh, American Indian populations as the indigenous peoples here. The uh, 13 colonies were devastating to the Northeastern tribes. And I'm sure many people are familiar with Amherst, Massachusetts, right? And Amherst College, UMass Amherst, named after Lord Jeffrey Amherst. And he was very well known in Indian country because he is the colonial governmental leader who ordered the distribution of blankets from a smallpox hospital to the regional tribes with the purpose of killing them. So our first documented case of bioterrorism is our own colonial government. But it's not taught in those terms. Most people are not even aware of this. And there's nothing you can Google. Google Amherst and smallpox. And you can actually find the letters that he wrote. And this is actually in his pen. I know it's a little bit difficult to read. It's in cursive. Uh, but what he says here, he's writing this to one of the colonial army uh, leaders. He said, you will do well to try to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets, as well as to try every other method that can serve to extirpate or get rid of this exorable or horrible race, extirpate this exorable race. I should be very glad your scheme for hunting them down by dogs could take effect. Jeffrey Amherst, so what do we do now? We honor him. We name a city after him. We name colleges after him. He was a murderer. He was a bioterrorist. And this is part of the, the fabric of contemporary American life, which is so frustrating in that we don't know basic history about our terminology, about our words, about where people come from. And I talk about these things not to make anyone feel bad. No one here is responsible for what happened at that point in time. But I talk about these things because it's the truth. And if we're ever going to get to equity, we have to walk through truth, even when it's difficult, even when it makes us feel uncomfortable. So please uh, don't feel bad about the things I'm talking about. That's not the point. But we just need to understand the truth. There are reasons why we see the inequities that we do today. And there's a unique history of Indigenous Americans that most people are not aware of. And we have to be aware of that history to develop appropriate and meaningful interventions to promote equity among Indigenous peoples. In 1830, there was a law called the Indian Removal Act. So the law, Indian Removal. So for those who like to push back against the idea of systemic racism, when you're saying you're going to remove Indians, that's pretty racist from my perspective, right? And the purpose of Indian removal was to remove the American Indian population from primarily the Southeast to what is now Oklahoma. So more colloquially, it's known as the Trail of Tears. You may have heard of that. So tribes in the Southeast were removed and placed into the Oklahoma Territory. And there's a very interesting dynamic that occurred Many of the tribal members refused to be removed. They wanted to stay in their homelands, whereas others were removed. So now we have this interesting dynamic where we have Seminoles in Florida and Seminoles in Oklahoma, Cherokees in North Carolina, Cherokees in Oklahoma, Choctaws in Mississippi, Choctaws in Oklahoma. So you get the idea. Of the 38 federally recognized tribes in Oklahoma, only four of them are actually from Oklahoma. The rest, the rest that were removed from other parts of the country. So think about that, loss of access to traditional sites, ceremonial sites, sacred sites, loss of access to traditional food systems, and then being placed into a new territory um, and then being dependent on the federal government for things like food. So keep going further uh, through history, the discovery of gold was devastating for the California tribes. There was actually a, a point in time where there was a bounty. You could actually kill American Indians for a bounty to make way for the gold rush. And during this time frame, we saw a tremendous loss of life. And uh, the first governor of California was Peter Hardiman Burnett. And he said in his State of the State Address in 1851, that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct must be expected. While we cannot anticipate this result, but with painful regret, the inevitable destiny of the race is beyond the power or wisdom of man to avert. 
So it's something that is just going to happen. We can't do anything about it. That Indians will become extinct in California. That was basically what the governor was saying at that point in time. So it's estimated that about 100,000 American Indians died during the uh, first uh, just a couple of years of the gold rush. Isn't that remarkable? So the population was just absolutely devastated. By 1873, only about 30,000 indigenous people remained in California. And many of those tribes are very, very small in terms of numbers, or some of them are completely wiped out during that time frame. So that's just a few examples of uh, history as it relates to indigenous peoples of what we now call the United States. So in my work recently, I've, I've spent a lot more time and energy focusing on the impact of unresolved trauma and chronic disease disparities. So my research really is focusing more on historical trauma and epigenetics and other factors that lead to uh, chronic disease disparities. So when we look along that continuum, one of the other considerations is that we had boarding school systems in the United States. And the boarding schools were forced removal of American Indian children to be placed in boarding schools. And the way that the families were compelled is that they were removed from their homelands, put on reservations, had no access to traditional food systems, and became dependent on the federal government for food. So what the families were told was either give up your children or we will withhold your rations. So give up your children or starve. Isn't that remarkable? And one of the results of that was thousands and thousands of American Indian and Alaska Native children being removed from their homes and put into boarding schools. So this is a picture from the Carlisle Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And I have four kids and I've seen lots of class pictures. And usually when I see a class picture, I see smiling, I see joy, I see laughter. I don't see any of that in this picture. I see fear, I see anger, I see sadness, and all those beautiful little faces that look like my kids. You know, these, these young, innocent children were put into these circumstances where they faced all kinds of abuse, well-documented, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, entire generation of indigenous people. And that was federal policy toward American Indians. And the goal was to get rid of the culture. And that was part of the, the British colonizing playbook that then became the US policy is to do things like boarding schools. And we saw that, like I had mentioned, in other English speaking indigenous populations, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, had very similar stories. It's a famous set of pictures of a Navajo young man uh, on the left upon uh, enrolling at Carlisle and then three years later. And this was shown as a success story. It's like, look, the, the Indian is no longer there, right? They took the culture away. And that was seen as a success story when it comes to the boarding schools. There's a picture of the, the graveyard that's right next to the Carlisle Indian School. And uh, it, when you look at these boarding schools, there's well over 100 of them. Most of them have huge graveyards right next to them. And the reason is we had excess death at the boarding schools. And we don't know why so many American Indian kids died at boarding school. We know that there were outbreaks of things like tuberculosis and influenza and smallpox, but we don't know why there was so much excess death. It wasn't all infectious disease. We probably never will know why. But I look at that and each of those headstones represents an American Indian child between age six and 12, generally speaking, thousands of miles away from home, taken out of their home, put into boarding school, and then they died and are buried away from homelands. And when I think about this, also, what is the impact then on the survivors? What if you're a child and you see so many of your friends and playmates and classmates dying at such an unnaturally high rate? Does that have an impact on you? Well, absolutely. And what did these entire generations then learn about parenting, right? It was It's all corporal punishment, almost like a military style model uh, of parenting. And it completely changed the cultural dynamics related to that, unfortunately. And this is not ancient history. My mother is a survivor of boarding schools. You know, she went to the Pine Ridge Boarding School um, back in the 1940s. So uh, part of my work in recent years is also looking at epigenetics. And uh, just real briefly with epigenetics, um, we can see changes to DNA when there is um, toxic stress 
And the changes to DNA, at least in some studies that we've been able to do, shows that uh, those changes can potentially pass from one generation to the next. Okay, so what would you like to hear again? <laughs> so just thinking of this in terms of epigenetics, um, uh, I really believe that epigenetics will provide a scientific platform from which to better understand intergenerational trauma, because we can see in some animal models in particular where the epigenetic changes pass from one generation to the next. And uh, we've done some preliminary studies that are really compelling. And what's fascinating, one of our studies, we looked at a traditional food called chokeberry, and we published this, so you can look this up too. But we uh, uh, did pre-tests of measures of inflammation and epigenetics. And one of the epigenetic uh, changes that can occur from toxic stress is methylation of the DNA. So actually a methyl group or a carbon group attaching to a nucleotide where it doesn't belong. And we uh, tested first in cell culture, then we actually did a clinical trial with chokeberry juice, and we found demethylation of interleukin-6 gene. This is really remarkable stuff. So nutritional epigenetics that can actually be treated with traditional foods. And the chokeberry has actually been described as a medicinal food for thousands of years. So in addition to identifying the, the causes and associated uh, signs related to disparities, we also need to study the interventions and things that could work to reverse some of these challenges that we're facing. And that's what we're working on now. Another challenge, uh, we have high stress circumstances in many of our communities and a lot of stress during pregnancy is not good. We know that uh, toxic stress during pregnancy has a negative impact on the mother as well as the baby. And then historically, um, with changes to food systems, we had access to very unhealthy food, <coughs> excuse me. So the WIC program, Women, Infants, and Children, in recent years, they've done a much better job of promoting breastfeeding. But when I was working as a full-time clinician in the 1990s, the reservations where I worked, the WIC programs were basically baby formula distribution centers, just handing out baby formula. And we know that as a population, formula-fed babies grow up to have higher rates of things like diabetes than breastfed babies. Hmm. But because of WIC, we wound up seeing higher rates uh, formula feeding um, uh, in American Indian populations as opposed to breastfeeding. So they have done a much better job in recent years to try to improve outcomes. So another food program is the FDPIR, Food Distribution Program on Indian Reservations. And that's also known as the Commodity Food Program. And the Commodity Food Program is a food distribution program that was largely very unhealthy foods that were distributed to the tribal communities. So now when we think of traditional American Indian food, a lot of people think of fry bread, right? Indian fry bread. Well, we never fried dough. That's actually not an indigenous food. It's people doing the best that they can with their commodities. So if we want to call it traditional food, it's traditional USDA food, not traditional American Indian food, right? So you see the child on the left with a big fry bread, and on the right, you can see the elder using commodity shortening and commodity flour to make fry bread. Now think about these engineered foods. So shortening is hydrogenated, just super saturated vegetable oil. Vegetable oil should be liquid at room temperature, but by hydrogenating it and saturating it with hydrogen, uh, you actually can make it room temperature that can last for years on a shelf, but it's also very unhealthy. It's a type of fat that can, can clog arteries and cause heart attacks. And so we see those disparities. And then enriched flour, I think the word enriched is probably the biggest nutritional uh, misnomer in history because it's basically all the nutrition taken out of the grain and all that's left behind is the starch. So a very unhealthy form of carbohydrate, a very unhealthy form of fat, and we call it fry bread. So when I go back home for ceremonies or for feasts, I always point that out, you know, this really isn't our traditional food. And then of course my family members get mad at me because they love their fry bread, you know, but, but part of our truth is that. We've acculturated, we've adopted these unhealthy principles into our modern culture. We have to be cognizant of that. We have to be aware of that. And we have to be courageous enough to address it, even when it's uncomfortable. But, but that's not our traditional food. And it's killing people. It's poison. Here's a picture of some other commodity foods. They had some sort of spam-like meat products with beef and pork. Uh, commodity cheese, the big bricks of government cheese. On the right, that's a container of pure corn syrup. Corn syrup is another engineered food that is ultra sweet, and it's in so many of our foods now. But if you look closely, 
This is coming from the USDA, our own federal government. It says, use in baby formula. So think about that. We're replacing all of this rich, wonderful, traditional food and even breast milk with these engineered foods and replacing with really unhealthy things like formula and corn syrup. And now we wonder, well, why aren't there such high rates of diabetes? And it's amazing to me how many researchers say, oh, it must be genetic. There's not a gene to answer this, right? We did not have high rates of diabetes prior to the introduction of these foods, prior to the impact of colonization. So trying to identify a gene is a waste of time and energy. And, and so what, if you found a gene, then what? Then what do you do? I think it's much more important to be more proactive and pragmatic. We know what caused this, so let's reverse that. But we don't see the same types of rationale in NIH. And we've worked for many years trying to improve the NIH priorities and then what they're focusing on. And this is a, one area where I think we need much more work. And so it even says on the label here, use on pancakes and French toast, you know, but uh, just remarkable. And this is federal policy linking to health disparities. So kind of going through that timeline, uh, we also see adverse childhood experiences. And I'm sure many people are aware of the ACE study that was originally done in the 1990s. And it showed a strong correlation between adverse childhood experiences and poor health outcomes as adults. And uh, ACEs have long-term impact on many factors, including general health. So we see higher rates of obesity, heart disease, diabetes, and some forms of cancer when we have higher adverse childhood experiences scores or ACE scores. We also see higher rates of mental health challenges, higher rates of depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, and suicidality. We also see impact on life potential. So uh, higher dropout rates, higher rates of poverty, higher rates of unemployment that are correlated to adverse childhood experiences. And when you look at the outcomes of high ACE scores, it's basically the same list of disparities that we see in American Indian and Alaska Native populations. So I'm very proud of my friends at the CDC, particularly at the National Center for Injury Prevention. Uh, the, the ACE pyramid used to have ACEs or adverse childhood experiences at the base of the pyramid. And there's now much more recognition that generational embodiment and historical trauma has an impact on those local communities and can change the local context and create social conditions in which families are at greater risk for adverse childhood experiences. But with ACEs and that stress during childhood, it disrupts neurological development, has an impact on social and behavioral development, adoption of high risk health behaviors and early onset of disease, disability and death. So uh, we see strong correlations between adversity and childhood and poor health outcomes and early death. We're about to publish these data. Uh, this is specifically from North Dakota and we wanted to look at the decade prior to the pandemic. So this is 2009 to 2019. The red bars are the American Indian population and the blue bars are the white population in North Dakota. And you can see between age zero and one, that's infant mortality. You can see how much higher that red bar is than the blue bar. Infant mortality rates are significantly higher for American Indians. And you can see it looks like two completely different populations, right? The peak in the 50s for the American Indian and the peak closer to 80s for the, the white population in terms of the age at death um, for the populations. So another way to look at the data, this is really remarkable. In North Dakota, the median age at death for American Indian men is 55. Median age of death, 55 for American Indian men. For white women, it's 85, 30 year difference. For the white female population in North Dakota, it's a blue zone. It's a very healthy longevity state. But for American Indian men, death at age 55 is the median. So I'm 57, so I guess it's all gravy from here, right? I've hit my median longevity. But it shouldn't be that way. And the vast majority of premature death is preventable, the vast majority. So that's why we need more programming like health equity research. How do we promote equity? We need to put resources into things that make sense, not identifying a gene, but actually do something about reversing the impact of colonization and doing something about food systems and doing something about promoting cultural connectedness and ceremony and reversing some of the terrible impacts of what has happened over the years. So the adversity does not end at age 18, right? We still see adverse adulthood experiences and toxic stress. And we know that living under toxic stressful circumstances is not good for health. 
uh, even for our adult population. So we have to have a much more holistic perspective on trauma. Obviously, there can be physical trauma, but we can also see psychological and emotional trauma. And I hope you can also see that there's a spiritual trauma when we look at loss of land, loss of language, loss of culture, loss of ceremony, even when our religious practices have been made illegal, we have to be able to reverse that. And again, one size does not fit all. So we have to have unique contextual programming for indigenous peoples. And that's part of the work that needs to happen moving forward. We've uh, been a part of and also observed some preliminary studies that are really compelling. The power of prayer and the power of connectedness on well-being is really compelling. And I think that's an arena that needs to be further studied. CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy, and there's a whole arena of indigenous mindfulness, traditional uh, perspectives on prayer and gratitude. And what we see in this, the studies, again, are very compelling. When we're concentrating on things that make us angry, it raises our blood pressure, raises our blood sugar, raises our cortisol, raises our epinephrine. But we're, when we're mindful of things that we're grateful for, it reverses all of that to such a degree that if it was in the form of a pill, it would be standard practice. But because it's cognitive behavioral therapy, it's alternative medicine, right? Mindfulness is the alternative medicine stuff, but it's effective. And I think that as a health system, as a society, we should be smarter than that. Just because it's not found in the pharmacy does not mean it's ineffective, right? So there's all kinds of culturally relevant interventions that we can use. Uh, we know that exercise and physical activity is good, not just for physical health, it's a great intervention for depression as well. And we, we see all kinds of benefits. Also social connectedness um, and counseling, but particularly that social connection is so vitally important for well-being. And during the pandemic, I wish we had never used the term social distancing, right? Six feet is a physical distance, not a social distance. And what we wound up seeing is much more social isolation. In recent years, what have we seen? Higher rates of suicide, higher rates of overdose, higher rates of addiction because of social isolation linked to the pandemic. And we know that social connectedness is vitally important. And all of these interventions can be designed in a culturally relevant way. So for some uh, considerations and just being respectful of indigenous po populations and contributions to science, um, uh, the whole arena of oral rehydration solution or Pedialyte was actually developed working with tribes in the Southwest. That was the origin actually of the Center for Indigenous Health was the work of Johns Hopkins physicians developing Pedialyte and saving lives from preventing dehydration. Many viruses, uh, uh, many vaccines for viruses and, and bacteria were developed with collaboration among uh, American Indian populations as well. And many of our tribes were just instrumental in developing COVID-19 vaccinations as well. So we've participated in research historically when it can be done in a culturally appropriate and respectful manner. Also diabetes management, the DPP or Diabetes Prevention Program that engaged a lot of tribal communities across the country. And we learned a lot about diabetes management by working with tribal nations. So we've made significant contributions to many fields of science. We also have uh, indigenous healing systems and indigenous healing methodologies. And acetyl salicylic acid is aspirin. Anybody know where that comes from? Where does aspirin come from? Willow. Exactly, willow bark, very good. So uh, willow bark tea was a, a medicinal um, uh, intervention we used for many thousands of years. We've used willow and now we call it aspirin, right? So I, I often I'm asked what hospitals in the US are incorporating traditional American Indian medicine effectively. And my answer is every single one of them. Because when you rule out a myocardial infarction, the first thing you do is give them aspirin. So every time you're in the ER and you do that, you're giving them willow bark tea. You know, you can thank the American Indian population because that's our medicine. It was our medicine until Bayer discovered it, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's modern medicine. But that's just one example of many examples of botanical medicine. Also, the entire field of osteopathic medicine, A.T. Still, considered the father of osteopathic medicine, grew up in Missouri, and he learned osteopathic medicine from the Shawnee and Oto Indians. It's traditional indigenous medicine and co-opted, quite frankly, and now it now kind of billed as some sort of European intervention, but it's not. It's indigenous medicine. And there's just many, many examples of this. So we see all kinds of disparities. 
in health outcomes and certainly uh, educational outcomes. And one of our big challenges is the one size fits all approach. And I'm so pleased to be here at a health equity uh, research institute uh, because we recognize that one size does not fit all, right? And I'm sure you've seen this image or similar images where in the um, field where we have equality, everyone gets the same intervention, everyone gets the same Medicaid plan, whether or not it's effective, everyone gets the same curriculum, whether or not it's effective, that's equality. Everyone gets the same thing, whether or not it works. So you can see in this example, the guy on the left did not need that box to stand on. It's serving the one in the middle pretty well, but the guy on the right is still underserved. So through an equity lens, <clears throat> we recognize that one size does not fit all. And sometimes we need to do unique interventions for unique populations. So part of that, for example, with indigenous peoples is to understand history. Why is it that we have these disparities? And even more importantly, what do we need to do to overcome those disparities? So I'd been showing this image for years and, and describing it this way. And a few years ago, someone sent me an image that I think is just brilliant. And the, the question is, why is that fence there in the first place, right? Is it the package of services to overcome the barrier or do we need to get rid of the barrier? And what are some of the barriers that we face? If we think about this, we don't have nearly enough providers who are indigenous. We don't have any medical school deans who are American Indian in the United States zero medical school deans who are American Indian. Same with public health. We don't have any American Indian public health school deans. This is 2024, and, and it's just ridiculous. We need better representation. So we need to recognize that indigenous health is an academic discipline. While I was at UND, as was mentioned, we started the, the world's first indigenous health PhD program. And in the first four cohorts, we've matriculated 60 students into the Indigenous Health PhD program. Of that number, 55 of the students are Indigenous and the others are outstanding allies who have had direct experience working with Indigenous populations. But they're gonna change the world and we're gonna keep admitting more and training them well in uh, research methodologies, but also Indigenous methodologies, public health program evaluation, but also Indigenous evaluation frameworks, American Indian and Indigenous health policy and leadership. Uh, skills. So really well-trained in academics. So we need to recognize Indigenous health as an academic discipline. We also need to recognize Indigenous medicine as a clinical science. Long-term, I would love to see Indigenous medicine as a graduate medical education opportunity. We have so much that we're already doing that's Indigenous medicine, but it hasn't been framed from that perspective. And there's so much more that we could do and much research that needs to be done to show uh, from a scientific perspective that these are valid interventions. And then we also need an American Indian or an indigenous school of medicine and health sciences. And there's a model to do this. If we look at the network of the historically black colleges and universities, within that network, there's actually five medical schools, five medical schools based at HBCUs. This is a map of the tribal colleges and universities. And this is a map of the tribal medical schools. Zero, right? Could we fix this? Could we think big, dream big? So what many of us are working on now is an indigenous school of medicine and the idea of medicine being much bigger than just medications, right? The idea of medicine as a healing system, as a healing force that incorporates the medicine wheel, spirituality, mental health, emotional health, physical health, and recognizing that there's so much that we could do to promote well-being through an indigenous lens. And I bring this up a lot and people tend to laugh, but my question is, what if medical school was a healing experience rather than a traumatic one? I know what my medical training was like. It certainly was not healing. And I think about my colleagues that go through the torture of medical school. The, now there's a cap on hours, but when I went through training, there was no cap on hours during residency programs. And I see the majority of my colleagues and their training and then released into society as being traumatized scientists with no training in things like trauma-informed care. Why do we do that? And expecting the existing system to change is not working. And I think we have enough empirical evidence to show that the current system doesn't work. So perhaps we need our own school. So we need multiple health sciences. We need both the undergraduate medical education or medical school as well as graduate medical education or 
um, residency programs, and why not develop a fellowship in Indigenous medicine? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it be fantastic? And wouldn't that promote healing in many of our communities? And this is something that could be done. More naturopathic uh, approaches. We need more nurses and therapists, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, public health, allied sciences, clinical psychology. We need the whole gamut of providers um, that we could develop through an indigenous school of medicine. So where could this be located? We, we need to have a city that's large enough to have access to medical specialties. So for clinical training, you need medical specialist, specialists. So it has to be a big enough city. Ideally, no current medical school. And what I've observed is when there's a new medical school, there's pushback from the existing ones because we're competing for clinical training sites, basically. And ideally, a significant number of American Indian and Alaska Native patients. So some current places that we've thought about are like Rapid City, South Dakota, Flagstaff, Arizona, Santa Fe, New Mexico, Anchorage, Alaska. So we're in the process now for in 2024, we'll be doing a feasibility study for Indigenous School of Medicine. So we need allopathic medicine. We need people who are going to an accredited medical school and passing boards, obviously. But there's other things that we can incorporate, land-based healing. The whole idea that strong spiritual connectedness to place is a healing opportunity that we're not uh, ad actively pursuing in, in most medical schools. We need to incorporate ceremony and language and not just to learn how to provide ceremonies to patients, we should be promoting that within our medical students. And what I would envision is having self-assessments of wellness of medical students upon entering and then self-assessment of wellness upon graduating and it should improve. And what if we had entire cohorts of healers, physicians and other providers who actually were healed themselves by the time they were seeing patients full time. Wouldn't that be beautiful? And shouldn't that be our goal? But are we doing that now? And I think about my own training, and I, I say this a lot, but I had to memorize the Krebs cycle four times, right? So undergraduate biochemistry in the MCAT, medical school biochemistry and step one of boards. Never used it once. It's about as clinically useless as information can possibly be. I'm an old physician, I can just say the truth, right? It's useless. Mm -hmm but I didn't get training in trauma-informed care. And what's more important to be a good physician? Memorizing enzymes or learning how to do trauma-informed care? So we'll just fix it, but we have to do it within our own system, I believe. We also have to incorporate traditional indigenous medicine, not just in the US. You know, We didn't draw the line between US and Canada. And we have so many English speaking indigenous peoples now we can work collaboratively. Why not learn systems of healing from Hawaii or from Australia or New Zealand? We need to um, also have uh, healers on faculty. So medicine men, medicine women, traditional healers on faculty with us. And another component of this is we don't need to follow a time bound curriculum. It should be competency based curriculum. And I've asked a lot of people in medical education, What's magical about four years? And no one can give me a good answer other than, well, that's the way we've always done it. Well, the way we've always done it has led to these disparities. So that's not good enough. And it should be competency-based, not time-bound. And if it takes someone three years, wonderful. If it takes someone seven years, who cares? And I think about the training of traditional healers, it might take four years, it might take 10 years. Ultimately, that's not relevant. What's relevant is that they're effective healers upon graduation. So we can change these things if we choose to, but that's the direction we need to go. So there's a picture of the Oyate Health Center. It's a new tribal facility in Rapid City, South Dakota. Uh, very good friends here and family members on the board. And um, I know I see this and I see an indigenous school of medicine. And why not just one of the campuses of many focusing on the, uh, a healthy way of learning to be healers. So I always like to end the discussion with a quote from Black Elk, and he was a Lakota traditional healer from the late 1800s. And uh, he met with a writer named John Nyhart in the early 1900s, and they wrote the book called Black Elk Speaks. And it's my favorite quote from him. Of course, it was not I who cured. It was the power from the outer world. And the visions and ceremonies had only made me like a whole through which the power could come to the two leggings. If I thought that I was doing it myself, the hole would close up and no power could come through. And what he's talking about is humility. 
and the fact that we need to maintain humility. And it probably won't surprise you, but the the core value at Stanford Medical School was not humility, believe it or not. But in my own experience, when I see people losing their humility, they lose their effectiveness. In medicine, if you lose your humility, you lose your ability to be an effective healer. In education, if you lose your humility, you lose your ability to teach. In law enforcement, if you lose your humility, you lose your ability to promote justice. And that's a basic core value of who we are as Lakota and other indigenous populations. So in my own experience as a clinician, every time I walked into that exam room, I would think, what an honor that this person would allow me to be a part of their healing process. In education, every single student, what an honor that they have allowed me to be a part of their educational process. And for today, looking at IHER and the wonderful work that you're doing here and building here, I do feel deeply honored to be a part of these important discussions. And I'll go ahead and end it there. So thank you all very much. So I'll go ahead and um, see if there's questions. Should we start in the room first? Any questions or comments? Lots online. Um, okay. okay. That's what people want some time to sure. think of a question in the room. And I think we have um, five more minutes on the webinar. Um, the first question was related to the, and if you could please repeat it in case they can't hear me online, but um, if you, um, around the terminology. So the question was, how does the term First Nations used in Canada tie to the um, Discussion on yeah, very good. Uh, so uh, the terminology discussion and in Canada, First Nations is typically used, although that's evolved over time. They used to say Aboriginal also in, in Canada. Um, so First Nations is the term that's more widely accepted, but now they're even using the term Indigenous more frequently. But basically the Indigenous peoples of what is now Canada historically were called First Nations. So that's a, a unique term just across that invisible line between U.S. and Canada that was drawn by the colonizers. Yeah. I'll keep going. I liked um, this question. Um, there are no medical schools for indigenous medicine because that would not allow corporations to make money. So where would the funding come from for schools and research if not the corporations that also have big investments in pharma? Yeah, so great question. So where would the money come from, from the um, for the indigenous school of medicine, especially for not engaging particular um, uh, corporations? And uh, this is something that could be endowed by multiple sources, you know, just like we have, uh, you know, the Joe Rich Guy Professor of Medicine, why not have a tribal named Professor of Medicine? There are some tribes that have resources. You could have a tribal chair of medicine or uh, uh, named after particular tribes. There's also other types of fundraising opportunities, grant opportunities um, for graduate medical education. There's opportunities even through CMS and medical education. So we would take advantage of all the federal sources we could. But you know, what's really interesting is that there's a lot of international interest in this as well. And we would have um, philanthropic opportunities above and beyond what's typically used here. You had a philanthropist here for the Mount Sinai, right? In the medical school. So perhaps that's these are things that we can consider as well. Yes. So I don't, I, it's not a clear question yet, but um, I'm really curious to see what you learned about this. Hmm about how tribal, the influence of tribal leaders and it's their relationship to what you're proposing and how that could work. Um, and also what some of the variability um, across tribes in terms of approaches to, to medicine. Yeah, very good question. So the role of tribal leaders, but also the variability of traditional medicine systems in, in different regions. So. Uh, absolutely. They, we ideally would not have this base in just one tribal community. We would not want tribal politics to actually uh, derail the whole opportunity. So it has to have a separate governance system. And there's a model for that through AHEC, the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, where we could have more of a national consortium around governance for a, a medical school. And then absolutely, we see a lot of diversity of uh, traditional medicines across tribes and regions. So we would want to incorporate uh, all of that and recognize that some tribes are very open to sharing their traditional systems and others are not, and that's okay. So I think any indigenous population that wants to have a, a training module to benefit our students and future patients 
we would welcome that, even if they're from the outside of the U.S. I think indigenous medicine is much bigger than what we now call American Indian Alaska Native. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Um, you know, it's entirely different. Okay. Uh, thank you for this wonderful talk. So I was say what you're representing. Oh, uh, well, I'm I'm John Rip. I'm the dean for well-being and resilience. Uh, Great. But actually, I, I had a question about some work that I did a decade ago. Um, we had a wonderful partnership with Chandeska Chicken of Community College in North Dakota, and uh, in helping to start uh, sort of a summer pipeline program, mm -hmm. um, we sent students from here out there. Uh, and it, it was a beautiful partnership, and and the president of the college was very clear. The goal was to train a local doctor. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we ever were able to accomplish that. In many ways, I think our people got a lot more by learning so yeah. much of, of this and, and coming back and, and bringing that with them, learning the truth. They but yeah. What are your thoughts? I mean, you're talking about an indigenous school of medicine, um, but you know, how do, how do we, how do you sort of start earlier yeah. so you can get those folks really connected you know those kind of pipeline yeah. programs? Yeah, very good. And and uh, I know the program you're talking about. Uh, so I know Cynthia Lindquist yeah, is the yeah. president of uh, Chankadesh Kachikana, uh, yeah. is the, the um, tribal college. It's at the Spirit Lake Reservation in North Dakota. It's really close to where I worked at University of North Dakota, actually, sure. in Grand Forks. Um, so absolutely, the, the other consideration, usually when I see medical schools wanting to increase American Indian enrollment, they say, okay, where are the Indians with high MCAT scores, you know? That's not where you start. It's got to be way upstream from there. So this is a long-term intervention. This is intergenerational. Mm -hmm. So we need to have better early childhood education. We need to have uh, much more influence at the primary school and high school levels and have culturally relevant pre-med programs. And there's a lot of universities that want to partner on that. And there's certainly a network of tribal colleges that would be good to do that. And I think we've learned a lot about uh, remote education through the pandemic. That's maybe a silver lining is that we don't have to have all of the faculty all in every single location so we can centralize a lot of that effort. So absolutely, we have to build that pathway toward medicine and other health sciences. It has to start very early, but this is the long game. I mean, it took generations to cause the inequities. It's going to take generations to fix it. So it's not going to happen in my lifetime, but my goal would be that the, the students we train now, the ripple effects they'll have across generations will make it happen. But excellent question. Yes. Thank you for inspiring us. Um, when we and I heard think about partnership with folks like you, the communities you represent, um, but that we don't have a lot of skills specifically in indigenous health or indigenous health research, I'm interested in your view of what a role could be. It is a role more, we should be focusing on indigenous populations in New York State. Is it, um, we come and serve because you have questions? Is it that we find questions in common across different populations? What is what is your vision of people who have some skills but not skills working with the population? And can we be of service and how? Well, a couple things, uh, um, depends if you're having more of a national focus or regional focus or, or mainly New York. So it kind of depends on, on what the, the focus is, but particularly with tribes here, for example, in the state of New York, you know, one of the things that I've done where I've worked is recognize that the tribes and the communities have their own priorities. And I don't assume that I know what they are. So we're actually doing a huge research project right now in the Great Plains called the Great Plains Initiative, where we're working with tribes and communities to develop community-based research priorities. So an inventory of tribal research priorities. So I might have my assumptions and they might be right, but we don't know that for sure. So there's a whole process of things like key informant interviews and focus groups and, and actually working in a, a, a real meaningful way with the communities to determine what are their priorities. So I don't know that it needs to be designed here in this building, if anything, hiring indigenous faculty and research assistants who can go out into the communities and collect those data and determine what is their priority? What are their priorities? How would they even define equity through a cultural lens? You know, So it doesn't have to be all centralized in terms of priorities for research, education, and programming that I, I, would, I would gather input from the, the regional communities. Yeah, and cultivate champions within those communities as well. 
I was looking at hiring an indigenous health equity faculty line. That would be. We, we would love to have you help us recruit. <laughs> okay, I'd be happy to help recruit. Yes, <laughs> we have lots of uh, upcoming uh, PhD graduates as well. So, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Other there questions? Are, there are more questions online. I do think we're at the end of the webinar hour, um, so we will thank all of our um, participants and listeners online, and uh, we'll continue the conversation. Right. Thanks very much.